Good morning, everybody. Um, this has become, if, you're, if, if you've been here before, I'm surprised you're back. Um, <laughs> But uh, this became somewhat of an annual event, and then it stopped being an annual event for a while for reasons that I don't, I'm not quite sure. And now we're back on the annual event. I think this may be uh, either the eighth, ninth, or tenth time uh, that I've given this talk. Uh, I might be the oldest uh, reigning member of the Cape Cod Technology Council uh, based upon this, but. Um, but I always love it, and uh, it's always a beautiful day for some reason on the Cape. Uh, I came down, I have a house on the Cape, uh, but I live up in Wayland, uh, I'm a seasonal. Um, but uh, it's just terrific to be down here. I always love it, and I think in the future I'll probably be down here a lot more, as you can probably guess. But in any case, uh, just by way of introduction, I've been around, I've been in software for 40 years. Um, my father thought, when I told him I was getting into the software business, he says, what do you know about women's lingerie? <laughs> uh, the word was not used back then very often, and I didn't want to really tell him what I knew about women's lingerie. But, uh, but in, in any case, the, um, uh, I've, had the, I've, I've been really lucky. I've been one of the luckiest guys in the world as far as I'm concerned, both personally and professionally. I've had 10 companies. Uh, the biggest, uh, IBM, Lotus, uh, the smallest startups, I did five startups. Typically, they got acquired by the biggest, so I'd go from the smallest to the biggest and then back to the smallest and that. Uh, great, great uh, uh, time because software never changes, uh, I'm sorry, always changes. It's always refreshing and I was CTO of 10 companies. Um, I was VP of Tech Strategy at IBM because Gerstner didn't want a CTO because he was afraid it was a threatening position to him. But leaving that aside, um, the beauty about being CTO is you're always working on the new stuff. At least if you wind up selling your company, you work at the company you got acquired by, then you get a chance to go do it again and work on the new stuff. That's still uh, uh, what inspires me, is, is to the ability to work on the new stuff. So what I typically do is talk about what that new stuff is, at least from my perspective, and what that's what the exciting things are that are happening. And uh, for the most part now, I'm an investor in companies. I'm uh, an angel investor. That means you invest your own money instead of somebody else's. Uh, it's been great. Uh, I don't know if it'll continue to be as great as it was, because it's, uh, I think, uh, a much more competitive environment. But nonetheless, um, I have to evaluate companies based upon what I think the outlook for their technology is. Um, so therefore, I still study it like crazy. I still love it. I still code. Um, and uh, what I'm going to do is share with you the thinking that uh, goes through my head, which I've been doing for years here. And, uh, and, you know, and then we'll just open it up for Q&A and brick bats and fruit. So uh, see what happens. Unfortunately, I don't know if anybody can see this because <laughs> it's fairly low. Um, but uh, there's going to be a lot of content on this, so I'm going to have to walk you through a little bit of it. But what you see on this is the slide, uh, this title slide I used last year. I'm going to give you last year's presentation. <laughs> Actually, I'm going to give you a part of last year's presentation because, it, as it turned out, a lot of the things that we talked about last year actually came true almost dead on. But it really sets the stage, and the part of that stage is, is that there is more control that is uh, being exerted over the tech industry in general, but software in particular, by a fewer number of companies than ever in my experience. And that includes the times where you had companies like IBM and you had companies like Microsoft. But never has it impacted so many people at the same time, i.e. consumer computing. Um, and these are powerhouses of control that are now battling each other sometimes through the courts, certainly from, from strategies. We're going to talk about that because that is the framework, upon, um, the, the, the platform upon which everything else is built. Platforms are important. We're going to discuss that. Uh, these platforms are essentially controlled by four companies, the ones that Doug just went through. 
Um, those are the ones that we reviewed the last year. I'm going to go back and review them again. But to give you an idea of just the strength that these companies have and where things are going, and then we're going to branch off from there and talk about what's new. I said deja vu or deja new because, in fact, some we had the you know the first iPhone or the first iPad or something. Eh, we didn't have that much in 2012. We had enhancements to those things. So there's a little bit of deja vu here. Um, at the same time, there's some unbelievable stuff happening on the fringes that I don't think I'm going to have enough time to talk about. If you want me to come back in six months, I'd be glad to do that. <laughs> but uh, so let's start it off. Previously on Homeland, um, <laughs> Uh, this is what we talked about. We talked about Clomosoco. There's uh, cloud, mobile, social, and commerce. Forget the commerce piece for a minute. Cloud, mobile, social was the big thing that was happening really for the last maybe three years, but really last year really kind of came together, at least in the beginning of last year, uh, where we could talk about it. Um, and it had to do with platform shifts. And I'm just going to review that platforms are really critical. They have been for my whole career. All the money that I've been able to make and other people have been able to make, occur it really is time to changes in platforms. And the platforms, we're talking about big deals here. Batched online, if you go back that far, to transaction processing. Transaction processing to mini computers, then to PCs. PCs to client server architectures, as well as personal productivity platforms. Okay, when you go through those transitions, you see that the dominant companies that were in place in the previous era, most of them don't make it through. <laughs> okay, they, the new companies wind up becoming the new dominant companies. And that has to do with a couple things. One is a lot of the CTOs and the big companies, once they, they become the dominant companies, kind of go to sleep. <laughs> they think that their way of doing things is the way that it's always going to be. And this new stuff is just at the fringes. We'll worry about that later. And then they find out all of a sudden that's the new stuff is what's becoming dominant. <laughs> then they go out and have to acquire companies. Here I am. I'm ready to be acquired. Thanks very much. Then that company essentially tries, but by that time the new companies become dominant as well and the old companies kind of fade. The other issue that happens in those platform shifts is distribution changes. When you looked at mainframe software, it was sold through direct sales forces with big you know, offices all over the world, with salesmen coming to your door for big money. Then you went to the PC and you went to the, went to the store. Okay, you got client server sometimes downloaded from the net. Then increasingly software becomes downloaded from the net. So that becomes a new distribution channel. So changes in distribution and changes in technology create great opportunities for shifting. So what has happened? What was the change that occurred? Well, we had the big change, if you will, from PC's client server to web. We may have had the change from web to web 2.0, but the bigger change was underlying that, which is with the change to cloud, mobile, and social. It kind of got buried in the web 2.0 stuff, but that was the big change. Companies that essentially pioneered cloud, mobile, and social, Facebook, Twitter, on the social side, mobile, largely Apple, Google, okay, commerce being Amazon, cloud being Amazon, uh, maybe some other ones we'll talk about in a few minutes. When those businesses started to get built, nothing really changed <laughs> to get us to very large businesses. The distribution model stayed the same. The CTOs all of a sudden were a lot smarter in these companies. And so they were able to accumulate more power without being disrupted, which has been the history of the business prior to this. So their platforms became more entrenched, and they achieved more power. And it's very hard, in my opinion, for anybody to bust these guys up. Okay, they, we are going to live with Apple, Facebook, uh, Amazon, and uh, what did I forget? Google. Um, uh, for a long time, okay, they're, they're the platforms that we're going to build everything upon, and that's what's happening. There's unlikely to be a lot of new platforms emerging. So what that says is if there's not a big shift, then the opportunities that I used to capitalize on perhaps aren't as big as they used to be. 
we will build on top of those platforms, but the idea of getting a big platform shift is probably not going to happen. So the idea of creating very large new software companies that can become dominant, I think, isn't going to be as easy, at least, as it was before. So I'm not going to talk about investing in finance and all the stuff which I did talk about last time. But we've got a big shift here, and um, it's going to continue to be these dominant players that are going to control, essentially, the platforms upon which we build everything else. So. This was the chart, and again, you can't see it down here, but these companies are growing very, very rapidly. Uh, they're all public companies now. Uh, it may be a surprise to you, for example, that the cloud business at Amazon is already a billion dollar business. Okay, the, if you know anything about the Amazon cloud business, they are the dominant players. Um, and uh, it was started because they had excess capacity based upon Christmas, um, uh, 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 you know, the activity. Uh, everybody wanted to buy at Amazon on Christmas, and then when Christmas was over, they had all this excess, extra capacity, and they decided, why don't we start a business that essentially could use that extra capacity. That is now a billion dollar business. Um, that's how these businesses essentially get established. So the powerhouses are social with Facebook, uh, mobile with Apple, as we'll discuss. And Apple is in a really good position, even though its stock is down 200 points. Uh, Google, uh, largely for search, which still is a huge category, and finally cloud and commerce with Amazon. So this is, as I said last year, what we discussed. I had speculated that, uh, that there were essentially New Year's resolutions that were being offered by the guys that were running these companies as to what they wanted to do. Um, and I'll just go through them because we're going to come back to this, which is uh, Facebook, uh, Mark says, you know, I want to be the world's dominant social network. He is, all right? Uh, uh, unbelievable. There's a half a petabyte being a added to Facebook every day. Okay, try to think about how much data they are now controlling. Uh, I mean, mind-boggling amounts of information. All about you. <laughs> Who's not on Facebook? Okay. <laughs> Just a question, why? No, no friends? <laughs> Is that it, really? Sorry. <laughs> um, it's, it's amazing. I mean, people wake up in the morning, I do, and go to Facebook. Okay, see the picture of the grandkids, all this stuff. This is a phenomenon that didn't exist five years ago. Okay, it's, a, it's stunning. So this guy built it. Good for him. Um, they're still doing great search. I'm sorry, great things. Search is a big opportunity for them because now you can search everything about people as opposed to just stuff. Um, they, I think they blunted Google+. Plus. I don't know anybody who's a big Google+, Plus person, but that was supposed to be the big Facebook competitor. It, there's too much, uh, essentially, of the network effects that we used to talk about that essentially says people re revert back to Facebook. I think Google+, Plus has failed, even though it's got people that still use it. How many times have you registered now for a new site by using Facebook as the registration vehicle? All right. When you go and you sign up, you, now you see almost on every site, oh, sign up with Facebook. Yeah, well now they become the vehicle for authentication for every other site. <laughs> okay, they can see traffic. They can see where people are signing up. They can essentially contact you when you look at the fine print. Um, it's another power position that they become the world's authentication site. Um, they've extended their reach that way. So it becomes bigger and bigger in the true network effects that used to be the thing that we talk about with Windows, etc. This is really people network effects where the people and companies now are coming together there another I mean that's a, I predicted stocks on previous occasions here um, I predicted Netflix last year it didn't quite work out because they were idiots in what they did but was, I still think they're in a um, in a really powerful position uh, and probably likely to get acquired I think this is now a cheap stock and uh, the the uh, essentially I think the world is starting to recognize that if you've seen what it's been doing of late, it's been going up. But they are in a unbelievable power, powerful position. Google, on the other hand, I'm not so sure about. There's stories going around now that I think are deadly, that their infrastructure 
is essentially dated. <laughs> okay, they, and they've got a huge infrastructure and now there's people are speculating that they're not able to move that in infrastructure very quickly. So when it gets to be that big, competitively, if you've got to replace it, I mean, think about if Facebook has to replace its infrastructure, it used to be one thing when you had a mainframe. When you've got distributed computers running petabytes of information, it's mind-boggling on the scale of how you do stuff that we used to take for granted. Google's potentially got a problem there. Google Plus has, in my opinion, failed, not surprisingly. Um, if you know anything about, essentially, their application, uh, uh, their, their cloud platform, their pass platform, platform as a service, platform as a service platform. Uh, that has failed. They've not done a good job. They're still great in mail. They're great in search. They own search. We'll come back to that in a second. But they seem to be very confused. They've got one thing that's really going for them well, and that's Android. Uh, how many people have Android phones here? How many people have iPhones? How many people have Android phones and iPhones? <laughs> there. Um, um, the problem with Android for Google is they don't make a dime on it. It's open source. It's essentially on phones. That was the whole idea. But they're also potentially in patent problems on Android. I'm not going to go into that unless I'm asked about it. Um, I'm actually an expert witness in a suit that's going on about that, so that's even scarier. Uh, but uh, the bottom line is Google has essentially got search in Android. Android doesn't make them much money unless everybody uses Google search. That still will make them money, but I don't think uh, they're in a particularly great position here. Amazon owns the cloud space right now. We'll come back to that in a second. They're also the largest commerce site. And they're starting to do, they're moving up the stack. And this is a theme that we're going to see more of. It's happened all my career that the guys who own the platforms depend upon a group of companies called complements, which we'll come back to, that essentially complement their platform. Those are what the software vendors are, the application software vendors, the tool software vendors that run on top of these platforms. But as time progresses, the platform vendors crawl up the stack. They want more of that business for themselves, icing out the guys that were building businesses on top. So you want to stay as far away from the bottom of the software stack as possible. You want to be up here in the applications areas that essentially have domain expertise that these guys are unlikely to get, unless they acquire it. <coughs> but Amazon is going up the commerce stack. I'm going to ask a few questions here. Anybody got Amazon Prime here? Yeah, isn't it magnificent? <laughs> Don't you buy everything from Amazon now, from cereal to... Because they ship for free. It's 79 bucks a year, and you get two days shipping. How can you pass that up? I mean, that's really good. You never pay for shipping again, unless you want it one day. Two days usually works for me. So it used to be that Amazon wanted a whole bunch of other commerce sites that were supporting them. That was the affiliate program, and you could have an Amazon store. But you really wanted to buy from Amazon Prime because the, Amaz the affiliates would not give you free shipping. But Amazon wanted two years ago to keep those affiliate relationships active. So they wound up burying the prime, logo, the prime symbol that said, if you buy from this, so here's a bunch of dehumidifiers or something. Here's one that you wanted to see which ones were prime. But that would have been kind of competitive to their whole affiliate program notion or in, in Amazon store program. Now they do that. Now you can put, check a box and say, just show me the stuff that's Amazon Prime, which essentially screws the affiliates. Okay? They didn't want to do that two years ago while they were building it. Now they've moved up the stack and said, have a nice day. <laughs> okay, we've really succeeded with this. We're going to keep going. This is an issue. This power starts consolidating again. Steve. Steve is still with us in, in spirit, I think, and certainly in the company. Um, and what Steve essentially said, he wants to dominate mobile. But mobile is becoming everything. <laughs> we don't think very much about non-mobile. We think about mobile. We, I mean, one more test here. Who's got a, an iPad? Who has a tablet that's not an iPad? 
interesting, more than I would have suspected. Android? Well, we have an Android and, and an iPad. Okay. Who's, who, has a, I mean, who has a tablet that's not an Android and not an iPad? Windows? I have a Nook. Ah, all right. That we would put into the e-reader category, but th that's cool enough. I mean, that's all right. Still, you can still get apps on it. Yes, that's true. That's true. Right. Kindle Fire. Yeah. Kindle Fire, Nook, right, e-reader. E but Kindle Fire is technically an Android device, but who's, who's counting? <laughs> Bottom line is, all right, so what's happened with this? We're going to dig into Apple because this is, to me, something that's getting very big and finally starting to get recognized is that we're not talking about devices anymore. We're talking about ecosystems. Okay, ecosystems of external application developers, developers who understand the, the IDEs, the integrated development environments to build software across a range of platforms and devices I'm sorry, a range of devices that all work together to do stuff that any individual device can't do. And that is something that these guys own. <laughs> and it's going to have, eventually, a pretty big impact on the way you're thinking about what devices you're going to buy. Because you're going to wind up wanting to standardize. Because you'll go to your friend's house and see what standardization really can do. So let's go down here um, and... Uh, I'm gonna. So I was right on all my predictions. <laughs> so I'm just going to let this play for a few minutes. Uh, <laughs> my company is Lead Dog Ventures. I thought this was a particularly appealing slide, which says, Lead Dog, unless you're it, the view never changes, which has been our motto. What you can't read is, which is OK if you're into that sort of thing. <laughs> Note the picture. Okay. Uh, um, any questions? <laughs> Thank you, and I'll see you guys next year. <laughs> no, not really. Um, <laughs> what we're going to talk about is, with that as a foundation, what these platforms are and what the complements are about. What does that mean? We're going to talk about it specifically in relationship to these types of devices, if you will. And now we're going to include in those devices TVs and cars. We're going to talk about interfaces, which essentially gave Apple the lead it has today, which was had little to do with anything else than MT, multi-touch, which we'll come back to. Interfaces mean everything. They're changing again. Multi-touch voice, i.e. Siri, and gestures, which we're going to come back to. Clomo Soco <laughs> is changed because we're going to add analytics to it. That becomes Social Mobile Analytics Cloud, or CAMS, Cloud Analytics Mobile Social, which is a lot easier to say than Clomos Soco. Um, we'll talk about the clouds somewhat briefly, because it gets probably not as interesting as this other stuff. And then I'll just give you some random thoughts to wrap it up. Here's the things that I'd like to talk about that were not. Because <laughs> I mean, it's too much. 3D printing which is just mind-blowing. Arduino, anybody know what our, how many non are anybody writing for Arduino? A little bit, yeah, it's pretty new still, but these are boards that cost, what, 20 bucks? Yeah. <laughs> uh, that you have a development environment and you can stack Wi-Fi, and it's a whole new device environment, if you will, that's creating the opportunity for wearable computing, et cetera. You can get wearable Arduino. It came out of an Italian company. That's why it's called Arduino. Um, this is very interesting stuff in the Internet of Things, which it essentially supports. Again, that's a speech in itself, so I don't have time for that. I'm not going to talk about social networking. I don't have time. Um, patty, patent idiocy. There's more idiotic stuff going on with patents these days you could believe in. That's what's going to happen with these four companies suing each other. Uh, there's more of it to come. And and software patents in general are kind of crazy things, but I don't have time to talk about that. I'm not going to talk about financing. 
So, or would you rather be talking about that stuff than the other? Okay, no. Um, okay, so uh, platforms, they're important. We talked about that, that essentially it's been the history of computing that if you select the wrong platform to build your software on, you're a host. <laughs> so you better select the right platform. You can have the greatest application in the world that used to run on a Honeywell machine, but nobody cared. <laughs> okay, you gotta make your selections really good, and particularly, what are you gonna do first? All right, because you might be able to do the other ones later, but your business will live or die based upon that first selection. It has always been the case, it hasn't changed. What are you gonna do now? And the question is, even whether you're thinking that you're an enterprise software focused company, or you're a consumer software focused company, okay, essentially the big opportunities in the enterprise are based upon what's happening in the consumer space. Okay, so the consumer leads you follow, so you better select for your enterprise software the right platforms that are gonna feed that consumer side. If you screw that up, you're screwed in both cases, all right? So picking which one first is what we're gonna get into here. This is how platforms and complements work, and these, again, you can't see much of this, but I'll try to explain it. So here's the big platforms that I see right now. Um, we've got Android. And Android, you know, this is Android writ large, which is essentially, you know, Chrome OS, Chrome, the whole platform environment of what Google is essentially providing to developers. Windows, which has come out of the woodwork, I'll come back to that in a second. iOS, which is the reigning dominant platform, which is Apple. Okay, for both the tablets, the phones, the iPods, et cetera. What you have here is that those are the platform providers, and there's what's called an enabler. The biggest enabler of Android, and soon to be Windows 8, is Samsung. Okay, they are the guys that enable these platforms to actually be executed, i.e. the device manufacturers, the OEMs as they're called. Note, iOS doesn't have one, because they are the device manufacturer. That really makes it easier to get to both the developers and the complementers, because you're not going through another chain here of both technology and in fact, in some ways, distribution. All right, Apple essentially is controlling their environment all the way down to the retail store level these guys are depending on a whole bunch of enablers to get to these people. So in my opinion, right out of the box, this is a problem for these guys. These guys essentially can go direct. They have to go through a more traditional channel. The platforms then enable complements. Complements are the applications that run on top of these platforms. Facebook, Pandora, Twitter, YouTube, Kindle. All right, Kindle is not just a device, it's an app that runs on all these platforms as well. So that's, that's a really good space to be. So for the most part, when we're talking about who's in this room, you're talking about your complementers. You're not gonna be a platform provider. You're certainly not a user. And the users essentially work largely with the complementers. What's interesting here too is that there's a lot of software that's being provided by the platform provider that would normally be provided by the complementer. Uh, this may get too confusing, but YouTube is an example. Who owns YouTube? Google, all right? So they're both the platform provider and providing complementary software. We're gonna see more of that as more of these companies get acquired, in my opinion, by these companies. You wanna be here, you wanna be the one that says, here I am buy me, <laughs> okay? Because eventually, unless you're way up on the stack, that's what's gonna happen. Those guys are gonna come into that space. All right, so if that's the environment, the, the kind of the writ large environment here, what's going on? Well, we used to have, and this is a chart actually from last year's slide, these are new. <laughs> um, but it kind of shows what's happened here in the phone space. Nokia used to have Symbian. Symbian was a really big operating system and, and development environment for building quote unquote smartphone apps. What happened? It stunk, <laughs> okay, compared to touch. Nokia never got the touch idea. And the whole application development environment from Apple was all built around touch. So everybody wanted to use touch and this didn't matter anymore. Blackberry died, Windows Mobile until Windows 8 was Stinko. Uh, Brew from uh, Qualcomm. 
what, so what happened was the two, two dominant vendors came in here with unbelievably small markets, but the most number of downloads per day of any of the, of the uh, platform providers. So these were the winners because they had apps that made sense to people and a very easy way of getting to them. So this created an environment here that allowed for more apps to be built because more people were using the apps. This is this virtuous cycle that we always look for. And the result of that is, is now we have an environment that's largely dominated by Android and iPhone. And what happens with that environment is, okay, if you've already got an iPhone, don't you want an iPad so you can run those same apps that you've already become familiar with? And wouldn't you like a back end like iCloud that would make all that easy so that it all backs up in the same spot? Then maybe wouldn't you like a Mac? Because you could use that with iCloud? And you're starting to see the development of an ecosystem of choices where, where people choose the ecosystem and not the device. So for those of you that I would, um, should I, how do I phrase it? If you had an iPhone, why in God's name would you get an Android tablet? <laughs> how many people have that? <laughs> Who wants to answer that question? Yes, sir. <laughs> because I prefer my technology with more freedom. I only bought the Apple phone because it's a good camera. <laughs> Well, that's a unique perspective. <laughs> um, I've, I'm the opposite. I got rid of everything. <laughs> this is craziness. Why do I have these freaking Linksys routers running all over my house and a Netgear over here? Because what I really want to do is play my music from my iPhone through any one of the speakers I've got in my house, which Apple makes really easy if you buy the $99 airport device from Apple, which has a speaker plug, which is your access point for Wi-Fi. You can't do that with any other system except Apple's router, I'm sorry, Apple's access point, and an iPhone, and an iPad, and a Mac. Actually, you can do it with Windows. But that's pretty good. I don't have to go out and buy a whole house stereo system because Apple's kind of already given it to me. Oh, here's the pictures of my grandkids that my daughter has that she's put up on iCloud that I have access to. Oh, it's the video. I'm looking at it on my handset on my iPhone and my wife wants to see it. And I have an Apple TV, the little $89 device that hooks up to my television that when I select Apple TV and I press the phone, that video is now playing on my TV. You can't do that unless you have that integrated system. So what people in Apple, in my opinion, has done a crappy job of explaining this. But this is what you want. <laughs> You want this stuff to work. It works. <laughs> you don't do much. They take care of it. That was Steve's message from the beginning. It's, don't tell me about you know whether we're doing pass or in, infrastructure as a service. We're doing iCloud. Well, what's iCloud? Don't worry about it. It works. <laughs> Okay, because most people don't give a damn if it's running, you know, Debian, Uni you know, Linux on the back end. They just want it to work. That's what's going on here. That's an incredibly powerful position to be in in consumer IT, which is to say, if you buy my device and you like it, you'll probably buy more of my devices because I'm going to make each one of those devices more valuable in the context of what you want to use it for than if you buy individual devices that don't work together. We're going to see more of that as time progresses. The result of that is, this is Goldman Sachs, who came out with a big report just a few months ago, a couple months ago, that essentially says, look, um, remember those Microsoft guys? They used to own 95% of the marketplace. Except that was def defining, when you always do market statistics, it's how you define the market. And they continued to define the market as the PC market. 
but largely the buyers in the PC market were largely consumers. Then something big happened. The iPhone came out. <laughs> and the iPad came out. And all of a sudden, Microsoft's market share, which used to be 95%, according to Goldman right now, is 20. Okay, that's a pretty big shift. Why? Because they totally booted the phone and they totally booted the tablets. Meanwhile, who reigned? Google, which came from zero. <laughs> to 3, to 14, to 33, to 42. And as you see here, the projections from Goldman Sachs is it's going to stagnate. Why they believe, and I tend to concur, they don't have a good ecosystem story. <laughs> Mostly, people think their tablets are not that good compared to an iPad. Nor do they integrate well with other Android stuff, because Android is fragmented. IOS is not fragmented. It's only coming from one vendor who makes the hardware. When you have a fragmented system where you've got Samsung or some other HTC in the middle, and they're doing different screen sizes, and they're doing different things where they've put some features of, of Android in and some features out, it's going to frustrate you. <laughs> You're not going to be happy even if you have an Android phone and an Android tablet compared to if you had an iPhone and an iPad. In my opinion, that's why this stagnates. Unless they can get a much better story, Google, they're essentially going to have the low end of the smartphone market and the low end of the tablet market. Low end means cheaper and you get what you pay for. Goldman Sachs believes that Microsoft's actually going to do okay here. I can't quite get there. My experience, how many people have Windows 8? <laughs> One! <laughs> what do you think? You got another PC? I have a Windows phone. Do you have a Windows 8 PC? I have a dual boot machine. Yeah, which one? Uh, Saturn 8. Uh-huh. I don't want to put you on the spot, but every one of my friends, I have not put up 8 because everybody I talk to says don't. <laughs> and I'm a geek. <laughs> Um, it's on the PC, they're saying it's a disaster. And these are guys that know, I mean, these are ex-Lotus guys, I mean, engineers. And, I mean, where do I find this out? Facebook. Because <laughs> they're cropping all over Microsoft on, on Facebook. But Windows 8 on the phone and the pads apparently is pretty neat. I haven't gotten there yet. But they are coming from a position of zero with a very small base of developers, great development tools they've always had. But why Goldman thinks this is beyond me and the guy never explains it. He just says that the business users who are Office users are going to come across and wind up standardizing because they want to use Office 365 and all that. That that ecosystem around Office is going to be the thing that makes their phones and their pads, tablets, really compelling. I think that's a stretch, but nonetheless, that's how it's sorting out. But again, this is Goldman Sachs, not Landry. This is Apple, continues to grow. This is Android, kind of stagnates. This is Microsoft, and everybody else disappears. <laughs> These are the platforms. So, just briefly, when you're doing platforms, it helps if you're making money. <laughs> This number, I think, was stunning. Apple captures 70% of the mobile device industry's profits. Okay, Apple makes all the money. Android doesn't make, you know, the rest of them are the hardware manufacturers who run on very thin margins, and Google doesn't make anything off of Android, and Microsoft isn't even in the market in mobile. I mean, relevant. So you wind up that all the money is being made by Apple, which allows them to reinvest in everything to make it better, where the other guys are losing their butts. Microsoft, in particularly, on anything to do with consumer, has been losing its rear for a long time. Okay, so again, this is reinforcing of the idea that Apple dominates, continues to dominate. They make more money. By the way, there's on a $540 Apple stock today, $170 of that is in cash. Um, when you look at what, what that means, now, one other thing. 
Apple not only makes money on, why does it make money on the devices? One is because it's got a totally, in, uh, in an environment that essentially includes all the software and includes the distribution of the software, includes iTunes, includes movie distribution, all that sort of stuff. One place to go. Uh, but they also make a lot of money on the devices themselves. Okay, as opposed to a Samsung, which doesn't make that much money on the device itself. And when you look at the prices, these are ASPs, and I know you can't read them. This is smartphone, average selling price of iPhones over time, roughly $600. The average selling price. That's not what you're paying if you're subsidized on Verizon, but that's essentially what the ASP is. It's backing that up. What's the, sell, what's the ASP on the others? 200. Interesting. Apple's able to charge three times the amount of money because their devices are cooler and it runs with all this other stuff. So they are able, to, the same thing has happened essentially in tablets, $530 versus $300. Because of their superiority or presumed superiority, which I think they're even making more compelling, they're able to charge more money and you're willing to pay for it. The result of that is you have a richer group of users. By definition, the people are spending more money, presumably they've got more money. If they've got more money, then the application developers want to tap into that money first. Okay, so the application developers will therefore build for this platform because these people already are conditioned to spending more money. Okay, whether it be for the phones themselves or for the applications. Google doesn't have that story at all. Windows doesn't have that story at all. I don't know. I can't find too many holes in the argument here that says if I was an application developer, I'd build for these guys first. And tablets are becoming the anchor device. This notion of an anchor device is a very interesting one, which is, which is the thing that's going to drive you to make purchases in the same ecosystem? Historically, it's been the phone to the tablet. Now the presumption is the tablet becomes the, things you're, the thing you're using the most. And I will tell you, for me, it is absolutely true. By far, uh, the thing I use the most is the tablet. I only brought this brick here, this aircraft carrier. That's not mine, actually. It's about the same size as mine. Because it was running PowerPoint, and I didn't, and God knows which plugs are going to work with this thing. But so the, otherwise, it would have been off the, the iPad. All right, Because that's a lot easier to carry. I mean, I've been carrying these things around for ages. You think I want to do that? No, my tablet. I wake up in the morning with my tablet. Yes, my wife is right next to me with her tablet. <laughs> we text each other. <laughs> um, and we go to bed with our tablets. I'm not kidding. That's how we go to sleep. <laughs> Don't let you guys think about that for a bit. But, um, <laughs> So, I mean, is that ring true? I mean, do you, if you have a tablet, are you, aren't you on it most of the time? I mean, it starts competing with TV, or you're using it for the TV, or you're driving the TV from it, which is going to be more and more the case. So, tablets become the defining device. Users owning a tablet and a smartphone spent 2.4x more on content than users with only a smartphone. Hmm. <laughs> that means the application developers or the content providers are making a lot more money if they have both, which is the likelihood to occur. Both are probably going to be Apple devices, in my opinion. <laughs> TV is probably going to be the next revolution. And that's really up for grabs. Um, Apple has been talking about TV for a while. They've referred to Apple TV, which is just a box which connects to your TV, as a hobby. They have. <laughs> uh, it's an interesting way of putting it that we're investing in a company that has a hobby. But um, I think they're completely trying to fly below the radar. One more question, and it probably won't be the last. How many people have Apple TV? <coughs> Do you like it? Oh, yeah, I love it too. <laughs> I prefer the Xbox. For $89. Sorry? I prefer the Xbox, but I have both. 
Uh, you you have Apple TV for the Xbox. No, I have Apple TV in it. And an Xbox. Yes. The Xbox. Yes. Okay. Okay. I use Apple products. Um, you can't play a video from your iPhone through your Xbox. I don't want to do that. Why not? Uh, just don't. <laughs> okay. Um, we all have our idiosyncrasies, don't we, Ken? Yes. Right. Um, so, uh, uh, well, I do. <laughs> Um, and and the point being here, it's eighty nine dollars. <laughs> yes. The, the uh, Apple phone, Apple uh, TV, doesn't play Amazon Prime. It's a great point. Correct. Uh, that may be true. Was the question? To my point, precisely. <laughs> the Apple TV doesn't play the Amazon video, uh, the streaming service. Oh crap! <laughs> Maybe I'll just have to get the the Apple TV uh, with uh, with iTunes instead. Sorry. You have to buy both. Well, you didn't have to buy Amazon. <laughs> you didn't have to. Yeah. Yeah. Netflix is part of the Apple TV. Um, so yeah, because they uh, they did that deal. I mean, it's come on, people. <laughs> it's happening. You want it to work together. You get frustrated when it doesn't. Stop being frustrated. Just go with it. Just go with it. Um, all right. TVs could be the breakthrough here, but I don't see anything coming out of Google that makes any sense. Apple's at least um, uh, made a shot at this. Microsoft is all over the map again. Um, so once again, through the ignorance of others, I think Apple has the inside shot. Uh, the thing is, TVs are interesting from the perspective that they are the biggest expense item that you're probably going to have in this environment, because they're expensive, relatively. They also stay, in, stay on for ages, All right, the, you know, seven years or something, I think is the average life of a, of a modern TV. So once you've made that investment, you want everything else to work with it, don't you? <laughs> so that becomes eventually the new anchor device. We're going to talk about another capability that's coming in underneath that might screw that up, in fact, but uh, in one second. But smart TVs become attractive. People say, well, they're low margin. Okay, yeah, it's, it's, so were phones. <laughs> Somehow, Apple managed to make that all work. So the likelihood is that we're going to see something, and this is a mock-up, that looks like this. It's an ITV, and it has stuff that looks magnificently like the stuff you got from Apple TV and more. With one big one here called Siri. Siri's your voice interface. Remember, they pioneered multi-touch. That was your touch interface. They've pioneered voice interfaces in a way that's never before been done. Okay, with Siri, and I use Siri, not a lot, but this is the beginning. So if I want to find out, hey, Siri, you know, when is the 24 reruns from season six going to be on? Record them. That's how I'm going to talk to that device. You compare that to your cable box. <laughs> All right? And they own that technology. Nobody's competed with this. It's funny, nobody's competed with it. So this is huge. To me, it's as big as touch. And it's not going to be just used on the TV. We'll come back to that in a second. What can you do? Well, you can get all your iCloud stuff, you can get your photos, you can get your AirPlay. It all works together. 3D, no glasses, full HD. Pick a size. ITV apps, you can run apps on the device. They'll all come from Apple as well. And the screen itself will be touch. So you can do this with it if you want, depending on the size. Okay, it might not make sense. One of my grandkids loves to go right in front of the 60-incher <laughs> and put his hands on the things that he sees. But, uh, but uh, bottom line is, I think we're going to see this this year. Okay, and that, again, with no competition from the other guys, is going to solidify this position. <laughs> So when you look at the, uh, you know, the big four here, and Facebook isn't in this, but what do you got? Uh, who's likely to win? Strong handset presence, strong tablet presence, strong base of compliments, i.e. 
the whole application developer infrastructure behind it. There are 750,000 apps in the iPhone store right now. 750,000 apps. <laughs> it says two things. One is that's a lot of apps. <laughs> two is it's got to be really easy to build apps, which says prices are low, which says it's not a great business to be in, so I don't know how long that's sustainable. Uh, but nonetheless, the way it is right now, Google has a pretty big store itself. Okay, no tablet presence to speak of, um, and, uh, and good handset presence. Amazon, pretty weak across the board. Kindle story, eh, it's Kindle. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't work with any of this other stuff just like we talked about they're trying to make it work it's not happening Microsoft God knows they're new to the game which is hard to believe advantage here's another one that's gonna throw it this just happened November 2012 Apple officially announces it's an automotive supplier hmm. what is it it's called eyes free for all of you out there that are ready to buy a 2013 Chevy Spark or Sonic, which I couldn't even tell you what those cars look like, but uh, <laughs> they have, it's a fairly low budget car that they've gotten rid of everything but the AM FM radio and a head unit that talks to your iPhone. Okay, so the head unit essentially is the thing that now communicates with the iPhone, but not just to play music from the iPhone, but Siri, Siri voice command to allow you to do totally hands-free driving and say, hey, how far am I from that McDonald's? <laughs> it can understand this sort of stuff. It, what's the weather forecast for tomorrow? Uh, text my wife, tell her this. Anything that's not requiring a screen, it will do via voice. Uh, Siri. Uh, for those things that require a screen, it will tell you that it can't do them until you pull over. <laughs> and then it'll come up on the display. So your web access is essentially there as well. So if you wanted to find a menu or something like that of a restaurant that you're going before you go, you'll do it through the device by talking to Siri. <laughs> Okay, essentially the routing is essentially going from the phone to Siri to, to uh, uh, Siri's been integrated with your phone. Once again, <laughs> hello, <laughs> how many cars? Okay, I'm not ready to get a spark. Eight other car makers have partnered with Apple to introduce similar systems not said in the short term, which I actually took out of here, including BMW, Mercedes, Land Rover, Jaguar, Audi, Toyota, Chrysler, and Honda. No announcement from Microsoft, no announcement from Google. Wouldn't you like your car to work like everything else? <laughs> I think so. I, I'm, I'm not an Apple fanboy, just to be clear. This is all, I mean, I'm not. I've become an Apple fanboy because it's worked so well and what I see in the future is it continues to give me dividends. I can now have one of these cars and it's gonna work. Okay, if I get that Android thing, I'm not gonna be able to do this. Um, this is a separate thing. The iPad comes, with, I'm sorry, the 2013 Cadillac XDS comes with an iPad. Now my first thought when they announced this was, they've built the iPad right into the car. Okay, it's a touch screen, it plays music, I can, it's, no. It's like, what are you guys thinking? It's training. So you can be trained in another system in the XTS as to how to work the CD player, how to work. It's like, guys, just put the, they built a simulator for their music system, among other things, that simulates that which would be done in the car as if it's being done in the car. Why didn't you just use the iPad in the car? <laughs> Hello? <laughs> it's like stunningly stupid. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, and the word was is that the new um, um, Tesla sedan was supposed to do precisely that and apparently they didn't. 
But I think that's what you're going to see. You're probably going to take your iPad, stick it right into the middle of your dashboard, and that becomes everything that you want it to be because it's got everything already on it. Why would you need something and it'll interface to make your air conditioning go up and down, etc. So this is consumer computing. And as far as I can tell, it's being gifted to Apple. Next is gestures. And I'm going to probably run out of time here, which I usually do. Um, and uh, <laughs> interfacing Gagnon style. I don't know if you're. Uh, <laughs> give me the music, and I'll go with it. This is Tom Cruise and Minority Report, OK? <laughs> you know, this. <laughs> That's what this is, all right? Connect had it in early, kind of pretty badly done. Um, there's a new device from a company called Leap Motion. Just, this is going to be one of the hot companies. It's cheap, and it's apparently, I'm on the list, but I haven't gotten mine yet. Uh, that's what it looks like. It connects USB to your PC or to Mac. And it turns you into having the capability of having, as it says, an eight cubic foot 3D space that it's watching. And you can either use a pencil, or you can use your hands, or you can, d it's going to essentially give you the coordinates as a developer in the 3D space of whatever object that you're telling it to track in the software. There's a full development toolkit here. And so you wind up having a capability to do stuff with your hands that you've never been able to do before. And essentially, that is the interface to the PC. This device is going to be cheap. We're going to see a lot of them. And let me just, you know, if it doesn't quite grok uh, what you'd use this for. Business 3D modeling. OK, you're an architect. You want to show a building that's in. Uh, in a 3D modeling tool, you can to a customer, you can essentially you know raise the building, move it across here. Let's walk into this room. All that gesturing, as opposed to mouse movements or touch movements, winds up becoming a much more dynamic, as you can see, presentation, presumably. Um, my son owns a few fitness clubs around here. There's a couple franchises in on the Cape called Coco Fitness which is essentially automated fitness where they've built into the machines the capability for determining how much weight you're supposed to be lifting, what pace you're supposed to be lifting. This was all sensor-based stuff. Um, lots of uh, $10,000 per machine in order to, to do this for the franchises to buy it. Really cool, cool stuff. Why can't this thing just look and see if I'm doing free weights, how many barbells are on the device that I'm lifting? And when I go like this, it's what it's essentially tracking me. Okay, it's recording what I'm doing, it's telling me the pace at which I can do it. So all that investment that was done in a lot of physical stuff winds up being eliminated by doing these types of um, interfaces based upon gestures. So interesting, um, it's going to happen. So we'll have three interface technologies, one of which we understand well that's going to be applied to a bunch of new devices like TVs, which is touch. Okay, two is Siri, very artificial intelligence driven, huge databases. If you listen to Ray Kurzweil on the notion of what's going on with voice based interfaces, I encourage you to go to Google and Google it. Uh, you'll find some really interesting things. And then finally, gesture interfaces that are going to be widely available to do things that we never would have dreamed to do. So far, Apple does not have a lock on this. I wouldn't be a bit surprised if they bought this company. Um, I'm going to leave it at that. <laughs> Massive platform shift and power shift continues underway, but even, even with that consolidation, one company I think winds up at least seemingly being on top. The others aren't going away, but this company's in the lead. Cloud backends, there's a lot of them. The backends are, are these, the platforms are a little different than the backends. Amazon's in a tremendous power position here on the back ends. Uh, Google's not. Microsoft Azure is kind of weak. Uh, the interesting ones to watch, frankly, are the carriers. Verizon and CenturyLink own Terramark and Savvis. These guys are actually doing a hell of a job. So this comes out of the blue. I don't have time to talk about that. 
The biggest compliments are Facebook, Twitter, and other SaaS apps. That's where you should be, including using Facebook as a platform. Don't be surprised to start seeing Facebook offering a cloud service, similar to what Amazon did. Uh, self compliments, which is the companies themselves who are the platform companies essentially building their own and going up the stack. We're going to see more of that. They're not stupid like they used to be, the CTOs. Where's Oracle? <laughs> Oracle never gets mentioned. It's one of the largest software companies in the world. It's acquired more companies. It's acquired two of my companies that I'm an investor in in the last two years. Um, Larry Ellison will go around and say, Cloud, what a bunch of bullshit. It's unbelievable that people are getting all... He's the guy that, that, that uh, owns NetSuite, uh, that created NetSuite. NetSuite was the first SaaS provider of accounting software. He just doesn't like the word cloud. He's got more cloud stuff going on than you can believe. But he, he's going to get his PR by busting the cloud while he's simultaneously making a fortune off of it. <laughs> Very Larry, if you know him. I've had the honor and dishonor of, no <laughs> of knowing him for a long time. Um, IoT, again, don't have a lot of time. Internet of Things, with all this stuff hanging around, the extensions with Arduino, with networking everywhere, we're going to see it now coming down from smaller devices to even smaller and smaller devices, as we talked about. Again, I'd love to talk about that with you at some other time, but not today. Uh, be there when they need you is essentially saying the platform providers are going to need a lot of stuff uh, that they're going to go up the stack with. You want to be the person that's there when they have it and don't be evil, uh, which Google is, by the way, but that's another talk. <laughs> so that's it for today. Thank you.